there isn't a subject more urgent than climate change. And within climate, from our perspective, there is no more important subject than how we communicate about it. And then within that subject, the most important thing is figuring out what the emotional tone of the conversation should be. Because even the nerdiest among us, and I'm quite certain there are a lot of nerdy people in this room, <laughs> we're mostly emotional creatures. We're physical creatures, we're emotional creatures. And then last, on a really nerdy day, we're intellectual creatures. The Climate Museum is all about helping to cultivate an informed and motiva motivated climate public. And this panel and your contributions to it are all about that as well. So thanks to everyone here. I felt like the, those really dramatic, horrifying stories about climate were not really being told by um, media organizations like mine. You know, if you looked in the right places, you could read them, but most of the really serious reporting by um, attention-getting outlets, I felt, was done sort of serially, so the big story remained only in the background. Um, each story was a sort of chunk, but not the big picture. And I thought that there was also a sort of positivity bias. Um, I think that's one of the things we're gonna talk about today, but you know, it felt to me that most people reading most mainstream media would understand that there was, climate change was real and was gonna be a real problem, but that um, something like what scientists understand to be a kind of median outcome was really like our worst case outcome. And I think that most readers, most people out there don't understand that things could get considerably worse if we don't take action. Um, and I wanted to share that news as I felt I had read it with the public. Let's, let's address the first point first. Fear is actually a helpful emotion. When fear it motivates, fear animates, but too much fear. Uh, fear in the, within the absence of efficacy, feeling powerful, feeling human agency can actually be quite dysfunctional. People who don't feel they have agency and, and the ability to do anything about the fear, they tend to react to fearful information in ways that are very counterproductive. Um, I just want to come back and, and talk about, just for a moment, what you said, that climate scientists, of which we have many wonderful ones in the room, they, they tend to follow the principle of least drama. So the, the <laughs> fact that the public doesn't hear like what the, the, the 95th percentile um, possibility looks like, it's very... I don't say it's purposive. It comes from the sociology of being a, a climate scientist. They are not dramatic people by training. They're trained to not be dramatic. They're trained to only show what they absolutely know to be sure and, and don't sort of fully fan out the cards and show all the cards because they think that would ultimately cost them their credibility. But as you very rightly point out, it also truncates the story. Like it doesn't give us the full advantage of understanding just how bad this could get. I don't know how many of you spend uh, your days with 20-something-year-olds, like I do for the most part, and, uh, you know, have, uh, they lead the way. I'm very, very, very confident about knowing that climate change is real, looking at it from a completely interconnected way. Um, leading the charge, it was the students that led the charge for the new school to divest, uh, and the faculty, you know, came along and, and worked, yes, absolutely, and, you know, we, we have a couple of new, stu new school students in the audience, and uh, one of the faculty that was there at that time, John Clinton, so, you know, it was, it was and, 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 you know, the, the young people followed, I mean, led, and we followed, and, and then took also our leadership positions. Well, you know, I, I speak to a lot of you know, college students around the country, and you know, the question is always, what can I do? And I think that part of the perhaps negative issue that you're seeing is that it seems big and people and young people don't have that, quite that sense of agency yet, and they're not sure that they can make a difference. And I think when you let them understand the small differences they can make in their everyday life, whether it's in the dormitory, you know, whether it's with their neighbors and friends, organizing, seeing a challenge in, in their community, and taking it on no matter how small it is. I think they really understand that they can make change. And I think the real issue is, does everybody believe that if they take a stand and they take action that they can create change? 
And that's what's, what it's really about. And you know, a couple of years ago on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, Community Board 11, uh, 12 in Washington Heights held a climate change meeting and it was packed. It was standing room only and I couldn't believe it. And so it let me realize that I didn't have to simply work with grass tops, you know, community leaders, but that everyday people were very concerned. And everybody knew someone who had been hit by Sandy in Brooklyn or, or wherever it was. They understood the issue. They understood that, but for timing, it could have been their community. It seems to me that there's a way in which we're not actually fighting climate change. We're fighting the people who want to prevent us from changing our, changing our economy. So that's maybe where art comes in, that art can give us a mode of envisioning a new form of life, new identifications, new ways of desiring, so that we can actually generate political will using not just sort of like emotions, which, we're, um, which we usually don't know what to do with as human beings, but new modes of imagining. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was a statement that I agree with, um, that art does have the ability to imagine potential futures, to think very far outside the boxes that practitioners put themselves in, um, and I think that is a role that artists can play. I also think that art provides a space that feels very different from academic, from science, from policy, which allows all these kind of conversations to come together. Um, one of the things that I've done in my projects is have this sort of dual conversation of giving people ideas around solutions, but also brainstorming on their own community-based solutions, on developing new ideas around solutions. So I think art has a sort of special role of being a little bit outside these sort of biased spaces where new thinking can occur. Um, but I, I've been heartened by the actual growth of climate journalism to be able to actually get out of that a little bit and describe things and the work that you've done at Climate Central I saw John Upton here in his great Atlantic City article uh, the work the, the articles you've done to really to break through into a more mass media space it's it's brand new right we weren't in this place 10 years ago with with this kind of coverage getting this kind of attention having a whole climate desk at the New York Times is a brand new thing I think it's only good news and it's breaking through more and more. So, hope. <laughs> hope, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna end on hope. Um, and, and I'm gonna pivot quickly from hope to huge thanks 